congregation. Before our scripture reading this evening, please join me in a prayer of illumination. O Lord, our God, pure, bright source of light, eternal God of truth and right, by your spirit dwell within us. By your spirit, let us dwell in you. Pour out on us now the ability to hear, the capacity to understand, and the desire to act according to your holy word. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Congregation, please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 8. This can be found on page 1137 in your pew Bibles. Our text for this evening will only be one verse, John 8, verse 12, but we're going to read a little bit more than that for context. We'll be reading John 8, verses 12 through 30. So beginning at John 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and from where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself, since he says, where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. So they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word. People of God, if I were to walk from here all the way over to the other side of the pulpit to here, I wouldn't have much of a problem. I mean, it's pretty obvious. I just did it. But if we were to wait a couple hours until it became dark outside when the sun went down and it became pitch black outside, and if we were to turn off all the lights in the sanctuary, how well do you think I'd do? We've got the stairs here. We've got the chairs there. We've got the pulpit right in the middle. Frankly, I don't think I'd do very well, right? To get from there to here, I would be reaching around, making sure I didn't hit the pulpit. I'd be feeling with my foot to make sure I didn't fall off the stairs. It would be tough. And it would be tough because I couldn't see, because I had no light. We all know the importance of light. That's why we turn on the lights when we go down to the, into the basement. It's why we take a flashlight with us when we go outside at night at a campground. It's why we wait to do things until the daytime when we can see what's going on around us. Light keeps us safe. 
and light allows us to see where we are going. However, in our lives, we often feel as if we're moving around in the dark, don't we? We're not sure of what lies ahead. We're not sure if there's going to be something there in our way. We're not sure that going ahead will keep us safe. The world can be dark and frightening and full of uncertainty. But it's into this world that Jesus came. And when he did, he declared himself to be the light of the world, as we see in our passage before us. And in that declaration, Jesus tells us that the light of the world is both our protection and our direction. This is our theme this evening, and it's our two points, that the light of the world is our protection and our direction. First, the light of the world is our protection. But as soon as we say that, we need to ask, protection from what? Right? That's a logical question to follow. If the light of the world is our protection, from what are we being protected? And the logical answer would be darkness. Light protects us from darkness and the dangers found within darkness. And where do we find darkness? Where is this darkness from which we need to be protected? Well, for starters, it's in the world. That's what we see in Jesus' first statement. I am the light of the world. And when he says this, Jesus is saying something about the condition of the world, that it's dark and it needs light. Because if the world was fine on its own, there would be no need for any kind of light. It would be fine. But as it stands, the world is in darkness. And we know that it didn't start out that way, right? When God created everything, he declared it to be good. There was nothing lacking. There was no darkness. It was good. But when sin entered the world and Adam and Eve fell in the garden, the world itself was affected by the fall. And so the whole world was plunged into darkness as a result of the curse, and it's waiting for the light. Romans 8 speaks of the creation groaning, waiting to be set free from its bondage, to move from the darkness of its chains to the freedom brought about by the light of the world. But until that time, the world is a very dark place. And we know that the world is a dark place, don't we? We hear of school shootings, of drug epidemics, of terrorist attacks. We hear of 52 people shot just last weekend in Chicago. We hear of laws passed that allow abortion up to the point of birth. We hear of an uptick in euthanasia. We hear of injustice and oppression, of anger and discord and unrest and violence. We hear of all these things and we know that the world is a dark place. It's full of sin and hostility to God. And it's one of the sworn enemies of God and his people, as we see in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 2, which says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we once lived in the passions of our flesh. The world the flesh, and the devil. Those three powers enslaved us, and they are contrary to the ways of God. The ways of this world, the cultures of the world, the trends of the world, what goes on in the world, stands in direct opposition to the ways of God. It's a stark difference. It's black and it's white. It's darkness and it's light. The world is a dark place, and therefore, since we live in it, we need the light of the world for our protection. But congregation, we must also note that the kingdom of this world has set up its reign in the, hearts, in the hearts of each and every person on earth. Not just the world, but our very hearts are full of darkness. Earlier in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 19, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, Jesus said that the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Fallen sinful man loves the darkness. Last week we talked a little bit about the canons of Dort. This would be the T, total depravity. 
This is what we see, that people love the darkness. Our bent is toward the dark. And just as we need to be protected from the darkness of this world, so too do we need to be protected from the darkness of our own hearts. Because our hearts of sinful, because our sinful hearts are dark. We can see an example of this in the rest of the, what we read this evening as Jesus conversed with the Pharisees following his proclamation. They didn't believe Jesus, and so they tried to disprove his testimony by ignoring what he said. You said you're the light, Jesus, yeah, sure, whatever, but on what basis do you say that? Who can back up your claim? They completely disregard the light of the world comments in order to attack Jesus on proper court procedures. And in doing so, they show that they are oblivious to the light that is standing right in front of them, that they love darkness instead of the light. And Jesus calls them on it. In verse 23, he says, you are of this world. The hearts of the Pharisees were of this world, and so they were darkened, and they couldn't see what was standing right in front of them. And what was standing right in front of them was Jesus, who proclaimed himself to be the light of the world. And just like last week, when Jesus proclaimed himself to be the bread of life to those who were thinking about bread, Jesus here makes this declaration of light when light would have been on the minds of everyone present. Because Jesus said this statement at the end of the Feast of Booths, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, the Hebrew word for booth. In your Bibles, you can see the heading above John chapter 7. It says, Jesus at the Feast of Booths. And that setting stayed the same into our passage here, which has huge significance for what Jesus said. Now, the Feast of Booths was instituted by God in Leviticus 23 in order for Israel to remember that when they left Egypt in the Exodus, they lived in temporary structures, right? They left the comfort and safety of Egypt. They were brought out into the wilderness, and it was their temporary home. They lived in temporary structures, and during that time, as they were traveling through the wilderness, God protected them and he led them by means of that amazing pillar of cloud by day and of fire by night. You can read about that in Exodus 13 and 14. And so part of the celebration of this Feast of Booths, apart from building booths, which Jewish people still do today, apart from that, part of the celebration of the Feast of Booths involved a special display of light as a way to remember that pillar sent by God. In order to do so, there would be four huge lampstands built in the women's court of the temple. And every night for seven nights of the seven nights of the, fest, or the festival, these lampstands would be lit while the people danced and sang psalms. And the light would shine forth from these lampstands, illuminating the entire court, the entire temple, even much of Jerusalem. The lamps would burn all night long, brilliantly lighting up the dark sky. It had to have been an amazing sight to behold. And it was surely on the minds of everyone who heard Jesus when he said, I am the light of the world. Because when he said that, they would have had in their mind's eye the radiancy of those lampstands burning against the night sky, that light spreading ac across their region of the world. They would have been reminded of God's protecting presence among their forefathers. And now, the God who had shown his presence among Israel by means of that pillar of light so many years ago in the wilderness, he was here again. Because remember, when Jesus uses the term, I am, it's a declaration that he is God on the basis of the name of God given in Exodus 3.14. I am who I am. Jesus is God, the same God who gave light to his people all those many years ago. He is the light of the world. But the Pharisees refused to believe. They preferred their darkness. The same is true of every fallen heart. We refuse to recognize the light of the world because we love the darkness. I'm reminded of the haunting scene of the last battle the last of the Chronicles of Narnia, written by C.S. Lewis. The evil dwarves have been thrown into the dark stable, and when Aslan appears, the stable is suddenly shining in brilliant daylight. But the dwarves refuse to acknowledge him 
And therefore, they also refuse to see the light. They act as if they're still in the dark stable. They're wandering around, they're feeling for things in the dark as if they can't see. And no matter what Lucy tries to do, she couldn't make them see the light. Their hearts and their minds and their very eyes were darkened, and they couldn't see what was standing right in front of them. They loved the darkness, just like every fallen heart, just like the hearts of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees loved the darkness so much that they decided to get rid of the light that had come into their midst. They decided to kill Jesus. At the end of chapter 8, they pick up stones to throw at Jesus, but he leaves the temple. And so when that fails, they scheme and they plot, and eventually they arrest Jesus and they crucify him. The darkness appears to have beaten the light. At the cross, the light appears to be snuffed out, just like a candle. The darkness seems to have won. But we know the rest of the story, don't we? Even from the very first verses of John's gospel, we know the outcome. John 1 verse 5 says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Right from the outset, John tells us that the darkness does not overcome the light. Try though it will. The darkness will throw everything it can at Jesus, but in the end, the light of the world conquers the darkness. Our hearts were darkened too, congregation. And the light of the world came to protect us from the darkness of our own hearts. And when we believed in Jesus, we moved from the darkness into the light. Charles Wesley's hymn, And Can It Be, we'll sing it later in the service, speaks of that moment of justification when the light of the world removes the darkness from sinners' hearts. When it says, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Your sunrise turned that night to day. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, your voice I knew. I rose, went out, and followed you. Congregation, the light of the world penetrates the darkness of sinners' hearts. It's just like flipping on a light switch in a dark room. The darkness disappears when the light comes. We're celebrating Pentecost today. And do you remember what happens to the believers who were gathered together? They heard a sound like a rushing wind, and tongues of fire rested upon each of them when they received the Holy Spirit, like many pillars of fire. It was a visible sign of the presence of the Spirit in their hearts, the hearts which had received the light of the world. When the light, of, when the light enters our hearts, the darkness is removed. And we are thereby protected from that darkness. That's good news. That's great news. That's the gospel. The light of the world has come, and he is our protection. But we don't just sit there with new hearts. Once the light of the world has come into our hearts and removed our darkness, we are then enabled to follow him and walk in the light. And this leads us to our second point this evening, that the light of the world is our direction. No more do we follow the ways of our former hearts, former dark hearts. Now we can follow the light of the world, walking after him according to the word of God. He gives us a new direction for our lives. We see this truth in the latter half of verse 12, when Jesus says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Here Jesus shows us what the lives of those who follow him will look like. We will not be walking in darkness, but in the light. Because if we are following the light of the world, we will have the light for our path throughout our entire lives. Now this stands in contrast with how we were walking before, as well as how the world walks. Because if your heart is full of darkness, you're going to be walking in darkness. However, if the light of the world has removed the darkness from your heart and you are following the light of the world, then you will be able to walk on the correct path. You can walk from one point to the next without tumbling down the stairs or crashing into the chairs. You can see where you're going, and so you can have direction as you walk. To go back to the pillar of fire in the book of Exodus, we can see that that light 
also gave God's people direction. Wherever they traveled after they left Egypt and until they entered the promised land, God's pillar was right there in front of them, leading the way. The pillar goes to the north. All right, we're going to the north. The pillar goes south. All right, we're going south. This way, that way, wherever the pillar leads, the people of God were to follow. It showed them where to go. The light from the pillar gave them their direction. Thus, in the pillar of fire, we see that the light is associated with God's directing presence. So, too, with the light of the world. Whoever follows the light of the world will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When we follow Christ, he will direct us. But what does it look like to follow Christ? How do we do that? First of all, following Christ is a continual process. It's not something we do once and then never do it again. Rather, it's something that happens daily, over and over, again and again. Because this is our sanctification, that process of becoming more and more like Christ, that process of casting off the old self and putting on the new. Following Jesus is a daily process. And it's also an intentional process. We must decide daily to continue following Jesus. In the Profession of Faith class that just wrapped up here, we read the book Crazy Love by Francis Chan. And in that book, he described what the Christian life looks like, that what follow, or what following Jesus looks like, that if life is a river, it is constantly pulling us away from Christ, that if Christ is here, life is constantly pulling us away from him. And so to follow Jesus, you have to swim upstream. It's a deliberate, concerted effort. You have to work at it. You have to focus on it. You have to intentionally follow Jesus. It's not going to happen on its own. If we just relax in life and if we go with the flow, then we drift away from Jesus. But to go toward Jesus requires rigorous action. Therefore, following Jesus is an intentional process. And it's also a process that can't be faked. We can't pretend to follow Jesus while still hanging on to our sin. 1 John 1 speaks to that when it says, God is light, and in him we have no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Walking in the light means living in accordance with the will of God, and our actions will show if we are truly walking in the light. Because our actions reveal our faith. And so we must examine our lives to see if we are lying to those around us, or perhaps even lying to ourselves, or if we truly are following Jesus, walking in the light. And people of God, Walking in the light is worth it. Look at the reward. Whoever follows the light of the world will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If we are following Jesus, we won't walk in darkness. We will have the light of life. We'll have Jesus himself. We don't have to worry about stumbling through life, but we will have the light of life lighting up our path. A light to my past should sound familiar, right? Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The word of God, which according to John 1, is Jesus. The word of God is the light to my path. And so as we travel through the darkness of the world, the darkness that leads to death, we have the light of life who gives us direction if we follow him. In a crude sense, Jesus is the flashlight that shows us where to go in the midst of a dark world. But we can still be tempted to ignore his light, can't we? We can still be tempted to walk in the darkness. Perhaps in the darkness of a party, where you're being pressured to join your friends in drinking or drugs. Perhaps in the darkness of your bedroom, where the computer screen is beckoning you to indulge in the, the, in the desire of the flesh. Perhaps in the darkness of your office, 
where you're tempted to fudge on your taxes. Congregation, in these situations and in every other dark and confusing situation that we encounter in this world, the light of the world is our direction. Now, this isn't to say that we should be asking, what would Jesus do in these situations? Rather, it's to remember what Jesus did for us by removing the darkness of our hearts and how he enables us to live for him. Apart from Christ, we would love the darkness of this world and be perfectly content in it. But if we are following the light of the world, if our eyes are set on Jesus, then we can do the good and we can walk in the light. And our walking in the light will also attract others to walk in the light as well. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Congregation, light is appealing. Think of the bugs gathered around your porch light on a muggy June evening. Think of people who are lost in a cave, turning a corner and seeing a glimmer in the distance. Light is appealing to those who are in the dark. It's attractive. They want to go to it. And so if we faithfully walk in the light, people will join us as we follow the light of the world. And so, Lord willing, many will arrive with us when our following Jesus reaches its destination. Because to be sure, we do have a destination. Brothers and sisters, the final destination of our Christian walk is the light of God's eternal presence. I know you just finished a series on Revelation here, and so I'd like, to re- I'd like you to recall a picture from Revelation chapter 21 when John describes the new heaven and the new earth. Listen again to these words. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light the nations will walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. The final destination to which we are heading if we are following Jesus is to be in the place of eternal light. There will be no more darkness. The shadows will be gone, replaced by the everlasting brilliance of the light of the world. This is the hope to which we look as we go through our lives. And so this evening, I ask you to consider where you are in your life. It may be that you have never experienced the light of the world, that you're spiritually blind, that you're walking in darkness. If so, you need to ask Jesus to shed his light upon your heart. Now you may say, he would never do that for me, right? If If you only know what I've done, my life is filled with one dark deed after another. But friend, the good news of the gospel is that Christ is the light of the world with no distinction. Christ is not just the light of those who seem to have their life put together. No, he's the light of those whose life is a mess too. Christ is the light of the world. And whoever follows him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Whoever. So if you are sick of walking in darkness, If you would like to have the light of life, then this evening come to Jesus and follow him. Or maybe you are a Jesus follower. Maybe you have been following Jesus for a few months or a couple of years or your entire lifetime. Let me ask you this evening, where are the dark corners in your life? What is the sin that you are holding on to, the shadows that are distracting you from the singular focus of following Jesus. Whatever it is, cast it aside, turn your eyes again to Jesus, and walk full in his wonderful way. And indeed, it is his wonderful way. We'll close with this thought, that we are not the solution. We are not the light. You'll hear that often in this world, that you just need to look within yourself to find an answer, that you need to follow the light that is, that is within you. But congregation, we can't make the darkness go away. 
We can't avoid walking in darkness on our own. We have no light within us to do so. It doesn't come from us. Christ alone is the light of the world. Christ alone can remove the darkness from your heart. Christ alone can remove the darkness from your life. Christ alone is our protection and our direction. Follow him and walk in the light. Amen. Lord, we praise you for the light of the world. We praise you and we thank you for sending Jesus into this world to conquer the darkness. We thank you that he conquers the darkness of our hearts and enables us to walk in the light. And we look forward to where our following will bring us. We look forward to the eternal light of your presence. Lord, grant us your grace and your peace as we continue walking in that direction, following Jesus our Savior, the light of the world. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.